we are more than ones and zeros, pushing frontiers of science to answer how we came to be, taking journeys to Mars where the tiniest pieces of life may exist, unraveling mysteries of black holes, gravitational waves, the nature of time. We are more than algorithms, peering into the depths of ourselves, decoding our molecules, our cells, our DNA, bringing hope to those who suffer from disease. We are more than petaflops, measuring the ocean's might, envisioning its dance with the atmosphere above and the seafloor below, capturing the global impact of a single wave. Collaborators, colleagues, and friends, we are connected by a common thread, the determination to make positive change. We are more than HPC. Please welcome your SC20 General Chair, Christine Quickie, Director, Navy Department of Defense Supercomputing Resource Center. Welcome to SC20. I'm Christine Quickie, the General Chair. On behalf of the IEEE Computer Society, the Association for Computing Machinery, and the SC20 Planning Committee, we're thrilled that you'll be joining us on our virtual journey into what makes us more than HPC. While we're presenting this conference in a different format this year, we've worked really hard to ensure that it resembles previous SC conferences as much as possible. This new environment has also enabled us to bring SC20 to places and people that we've never before reached. To these newcomers, I extend a special welcome. As a community, we use HPC to tackle the enormous problems that wouldn't be solvable any other way. HPC can help us reach an understanding of the world around us more quickly so that we can work today to create the solutions for tomorrow. As we find our field expanding deeper into areas of AI, machine learning, and quantum computing, HPC has become a key tool for a growing range of scientific disciplines. This is evident in the critical role our community is playing in the fight against the global pandemic of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. A global pandemic requires a global response. The COVID-19 HPC Consortium is an international working group comprising 43 member countries, including the US, Korea, Japan, Switzerland, and many others. Members of the consortium are contributing scientific expertise and over 600 petaflops of computing power to support over 80 pandemic-related projects, many of which are now underway. For example, on the Frontera system at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, researchers are testing the efficacy of existing antibodies from a previous version of the SARS virus to see if they will work against COVID-19. At one of Italy's leading scientific hospitals, researchers are reconstructing and modeling how the coronavirus binds to cells at a molecular level. On Summit at Oak Ridge National Lab, a team is using a machine learning classifier to predict coronavirus gene expression patterns for more than 700,000 combinations of existing drugs. And researchers at universities in the United States and Brazil are using HPC to perform social interaction analytics to improve contact tracing methods and better inform policy decisions. Promising to deliver compelling insight into the role of HPC in the ongoing pandemic, our More Than HPC plenary panel will dig deeper into the use of AI, the Internet of Things, and data analysis to understand and combat the coronavirus. Exhibits are still a central part of our conference. Nearly 300 exhibitors from over two dozen countries are featured in our virtual exhibits hall, and you can find them on the exhibits tab on our website and app. They've worked hard to create experiences that will engage and educate us in this new format. Please join me in thanking our champion level exhibitors who have helped make SC20 a success. SC20 has brought the state of the practice to the forefront for those who work steadfastly behind the scenes to design, build, and run HPC centers and the infrastructure that supports them. These professionals have a wealth of knowledge to share but few opportunities to reach fellow practitioners directly. To bridge the gap, the conference features dedicated talks to discuss practical up-to-the-minute improvements in areas such as HPC training, security, software provisioning, and data management. This year's technical program offers the full complement of content that is the backbone of this conference, including papers, panels, posters, birds of a feather, tutorials, and workshops. 
In addition, a wonderfully strong program of invited speakers will address topics ranging from analytics that inform strategic decisions to assure the survival of threatened species to the responsible application of HPC. For 30 years, the heartbeat of the SC Conference has been the SINET team and their marvelous feat of engineering, building what becomes the world's fastest network for the duration of the conference. While events have precluded this year's network build, SINET is creating virtual test beds to highlight emerging network technologies and has featured this work in several presentations in their program. As part of our continued attention to inclusivity and diversity, SC20 has developed the HPC in the City program. The Student Hackathon is bringing together a diverse group of Atlanta area students, educators, and civic leaders to demonstrate firsthand how HPC can address local challenges such as social justice issues. Students at SC continues to be a vibrant and crucial part of the SC conference. Our new HPC immersion program gives undergraduate students who are traditionally underrepresented in HPC and related fields the opportunity to experience the conference while guided by world-class mentors. We have transformed the student cluster competition into a fully virtual experience, giving an unprecedented number of teams the opportunity to participate this year. Thanks to sponsorships from our vendor partners, student teams are designing and building virtual clusters in the Microsoft Azure Cloud. We've also expanded the job fair this year, so that it's not just for students, it's for everyone. Those of you who have contributed to the SC20 technical program, exhibits, SINET, and students at SC programs have had to put in extra effort this year to help us have a comprehensive conference, and we thank you. We invite you to join us at the awards ceremony at the conclusion of our conference, when we'll highlight some of the top accomplishments of our community. Planning the world's largest supercomputing conference isn't an easy task, even in a normal environment. When I was first selected to be the SC20 general chair three years ago and began forming the conference committee, none of us had any idea we would be planning a conference amidst a global pandemic. And this largely volunteer team of over 700 people has worked harder than ever to ensure that SC20 not only stayed on the map, but did so with its customary breadth and depth. To quote Game of Thrones producer Christopher Newman, all you can do with any large operation is get the best people around you and let them go. These volunteers have given generously of their time and expertise, and without them and our partners, SC20 simply would not have been possible. It has been my deepest honor to work with this incredibly tenacious team. Please join me in thanking our colleagues for their tireless efforts. From COVID-19 to clean transportation, our community is tackling every problem we encounter with determination and speed. Whether we're helping to accelerate the development of new gene therapies or working to understand the very origins of our universe, we're making incredible strides. But that doesn't mean we can rest. We have so much more to do to improve the world around us, and that's why we're more than HPC. In a moment, you'll be hearing from this year's keynote speaker, Dr. Bjorn Stevens, whose study of clouds has contributed greatly to our understanding of climate change. This is of profound interest to me, both professionally and personally. I live on the hurricane-prone Gulf Coast of Mississippi, where I lead the Navy DOD Supercomputing Resource Center. So climate, weather, and ocean modeling have a direct impact on my daily life. Thanks to improvements in observational instruments and computing capabilities, Hurricane forecasting has improved significantly over the past two decades, helping all of us protect property and save lives. For that, I am grateful, and I'm very much looking forward to learning more as Dr. Stevens leads us on a fascinating journey of where we've been and where we need to go in climate research. Professor Bjorn Stevens is a director at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology since 2008 and a professor at the University of Hamburg. To say Professor Stevens is a man with his head in the clouds is an understatement. That's because he strongly believes that clouds are at the heart of some of the most fascinating questions posed by climate change. And it's why he's recognized as one of the world's leading experts on how atmospheric water, in the form of clouds, shapes our climate. As Professor Stevens explains, massive new sets of observational data analyzed with the power of exascale computing will break barriers for researchers building fundamentally new climate models, giving us resources to investigate the planet at the most granular level. 
Professor Stevens served as a lead author of Clouds and Aerosols for the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which informs policymakers as they consider programs to mitigate impacts of climate change. Professor Stevens holds a great number of prestigious honors, among them the Clarence Leroy Meisinger Award of the American Meteorological Society. He held fellowships at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Professor Stevens received a master's degree in electrical engineering from Iowa State University and his PhD in atmospheric science from Colorado State University. Here to take us through a remarkable journey to the clouds in the era of exascale, please welcome Professor Bjorn Stevens. Hi, my name's Bjorn Stevens, and it's a pleasure to have a chance to speak to you all today. I'm going to tell you a story about climate and computing. You know a lot more about computing than I do, and I know a thing or two about climate. And to help bring the two things together, it might be useful to know something about this book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The, the, the main idea in the book that's useful for today's story is that a civilization, an advanced civilization, has a big question they want answered. They build a really big computer to answer it, the computer thinks for a really long time. The computer's name is Deep Thought. It thinks deeply for 75 million years. And it comes up with the answer to the ultimate question that they posed. But by that time, the descendants of the people who built the computer forgot the question. So they went about and built another computer, one out of organic components, and they called it Earth. And the idea then was to go into the computer and learn more about the question that they got the ultimate answer to. And so if you keep that in mind, then you're all set for today's story. So it starts off here in Hamburg, where I'm at. And this picture brings together a lot of the elements that we're going to use through the rest of the story. Um, it also has the colors from Supercomputing 2020 in it, which isn't such a bad thing either. But the, the, the main point that you see here is it's a, it's a wonderful port city, and you see the, the face of industry and global trade in the background. It's one of the largest container harbors in the world. And you see different ways of, of, of living in the foreground with the bikes. You see a thin layer of clouds up there. These are stratiform clouds, which end up being a joker in the story. But the elephant in the room is the boulder, this big rock. It's called a glacial erratic in technical terms. In German, you would call it a findling. And if you go through the North German countryside, you'll find little town after little town has these right in their town square because they're dug out of the fields. And for a long time, people had uh, no idea where they came from. You know, how do you get a giant boulder in the middle of a field? In this case, it was in the middle of the river when they were deepening the river. So, so how does that work? And there was a time where people thought this was from the biblical floods that brought the boulders from somewhere else. But about the middle part of the 19th century, people began to understand that these were carried by the waxing and waning of great ice sheets, which covered the northern European continent. And the fact that these ice sheets waxed and waned across the continent meant that the climate probably wasn't always the same in the past. And that raised a question of how it might have changed. This rock here, it's called the Alte Schwede, the old Swede. It's called the Alte Schwede because it's been shown to come from a formation of rock in southern Sweden about 400,000 years ago in the Elstad glaciation. But the Alte Schwede is kind of a nice name for this because um, it points to another leitmotif of our story, this guy here. Svante Arrhenius. He was a chemist, and in the second half of the 19th century, he was interested in this climate question. And he began thinking, you know, how could this be? How could the Earth be a lot colder or a lot warmer? And he was informed at that time by the discovery that some gases were opaque in the infrared, even though they were transparent in the visible. And that these gases, which occur in Earth's atmosphere naturally, could provide an important mechanism for maintaining the surface temperature. 
So he worked out this idea that you see here that the surface temperature, T surface, or the average surface temperature of the Earth, could be related to how radiant energy, that's R, radiation flows through the system. And he thought about a bunch of other things too. So he introduced this idea of H, that the horizontal heat transport might matter. And he introduced V, the idea that the vertical heat transport might matter. O, other things could matter. And C was the carbon dioxide and water vapor. These were the greenhouse gases. So his, his thought was, you know, if you want to understand Earth's surface temperature, you've got to understand this stuff. Problem was, he didn't, he didn't really understand any of them. He, he, he knew that C could increase. He didn't know why, but he said, let's just let carbon dioxide increase. He said, let's not worry about the other stuff. And forget about V for a sec. That's too hard. And let's forget about H. And let's just try to work out the radiation. So he said, okay, we can imagine C changing, like um, increasing, like I just showed, to two or other numbers, two times as much. And how will the radiation respond? Well, to figure that out, he had to piece together the puzzle into, into giving a form to that equation. And he did that by making a little model which had two layers, a surface and an atmosphere. And in the atmosphere, you assign some infrared opacity, which then the C could influence. And by working through the energy balance of those two layers, he could pop out an estimate of how the surface temperature would depend on C. So he had a kind of method to do it, but he actually didn't even know how to do the radiation. He knew roughly, he had it all kind of going in streams, but he didn't know the infrared opacity here um, designated by beta. So the other clever thing he did was he figured out a way to get beta. And the way he got it was with some good old Appalachian moonshine. Not the type of moonshine you see there, but more the type of moonshine you see here. It's the reflected sunlight off the moon, which a guy named Langley had been using to calculate the infrared opacity of, of, of columns of water vapor and CO2. So by using the sunlight reflected from the moon, you could do the spectroscopy to get estimates of how opaque CO2 would be given its amount. The problem was these, these measurements were not in the exactly the right wavelength that one needed, but you, know, you can always extrapolate, and he did, and he took these measurements and he put them in his model and he came up with a, a rough answer. So if you think about that, this was the question. Would increasing CO2 warm the Earth? Fast forward here. This was 1890 when he was doing it. This is today, and I'm standing in a valley of the Mortarach Glacier, and that you see is in the background. If you look way in the background, you see that glacier. It's about three kilometers away. Um, at the time Arrhenius was thinking about his question, the glacier was right where I'm standing. It was actually moving down the valley towards the town in the 1800s. And at the time Arrhenius began thinking if CO2 would warm the climate, more people were worried about the climate getting cold and the, and the glaciers advancing even further into the valleys, into the town. So this question that he asked wasn't at all obvious. It was the ultimate question. It, tended, it, it ended up being a very important question, but it wasn't one that you would naturally lead yourself to ask at that time. And the answer was, OK, pretty rough. Um, but it outlines the, 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 the question that we feed to deep thought over the next 50 or 70 years. To understand how this goes, there's something else about the glacier and its retreat which might be informative. And that's that the glacier doesn't move all in one go slowly backwards. So the glacier started, it turned around about the time Arrhenius was thinking about these questions, and it headed up the valley. But it didn't head up in a steady pace. It went in, you know, uh, spurts. And you can see that here in this graph. So what the graph shows is in the blue bars, it shows sort of the yearly retreat from the, I think, 1870 up until the present. And then the, the black line shows the accumulation of that. So the steady retreat, once in a while, I think there's a few years where it comes forward, but mostly all the way down. And what you see, it doesn't happen all in one steady go. There's, there's periods in the beginning where it goes quickly, then not much happens, and it goes quickly, and then not much happens. And that's also like the science. So the science, or the way deep thought you could think about it, is, is trying to understand the changes from CO2 is not unlike this glacier. There's, there's long periods where we ponder on things that seem sort of unrelated, and then they come together in bursts of creativity. And once in a while, even in lull periods, like we see in this third epoch where not much is happening, there's that spike right there where something brilliant happens, and then we go back to the lull. 
And so this glacial retreat actually is a bit like the story of deep thoughts contemplations or our contemplations about climate science in that you can think of four epics. The first one was the first word. The second one was, you know, this, this contemplation. Third one was sort of brilliant discoveries. Then we have constructive babble. So those were the four epics up till now. And now we're at the position where deep thought 75 million years later, or in our case, um, 120, is about to burst out the answer. So let's go to the first period. The first period is characterized by about 50 years where people forgot all about the ultimate question. So they didn't have to wait 75 million years to forget. They forgot right away. No one worried about Arrhenius's paper, Arrhenius, uh, Arrhenius's ruminations. They were busy doing other things, figuring out the weather. But it turned out important. So this guy here, Wilhelm Bjorknes, also in Stockholm at the time, 1906, was trying to figure out the equations you needed to solve to figure out how the weather would evolve. It turns out later in our story, these equations are exactly the ones you need to figure out the H in Arrhenius' question. Another guy had this idea that you could actually compute the equations. So um, Lewis Richardson, he had this crazy idea that you could predict the weather by solving those equations, but of course they're much too complicated to solve. Um, and by the time you solved them, the weather would be gone. But he said, no, 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 no. What we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll have many, many people solving it, different parts of the equation. So we'll lay out people in a giant amphitheater, and each person will be at a particular point, and they will solve for their weather at that point, and they can ask their neighbors, you know, that's a one-to-one, um, -one. They, can, they can ask their neighbors what, what their information is to figure out temperature gradients and how the temperature will change. And everyone will compute, and if you look, you'll see there'll be a, 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 a scheduler, um, which will be coordinating all the computations with its little spotlight beaming down on the, on the different, um, essentially, nodes of the computation. So even here, you see the architecture of a massively parallel computer where we see multi-core nodes where everyone has their computation multi-threaded and the schedulers going around. The only thing you wish for is, is in this computer is to, I mean, node failures are a lot more dramatic here than they are in, in our modern machines. Crazy idea. But maybe it wasn't so crazy as we've seen, because the machines were be developed not that much later. So we go into the 40s. John von Neumann had this project to sort of blend emerging computing machines with this idea of computing the weather. He used a simplified version of, of, of Bjorknes' equations. But they showed with um, these machines that were emerging at the time, post-war, that you could actually compute the weather. And this was an important ingredient that was later taken by um, other people to, to fill in H. At the same time, it wasn't that people just were working on Arrhenius's H term unknowingly. People were also working on other terms, like this guy, Fritz Müller. He um, was at Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich. And he was doing a new assault on R. So he was an expert on radiative transfer. And unlike the other people, he was interested in Arrhenius's question. But he realized you needed to do R a lot better. And here I show a picture of him. And the graph there is from one of his papers where you, you see he's trying to work out this absorption feature from CO2, which is the thing that Arrhenius was trying to use to calculate his beta. He wasn't measuring in the right place or using measurements at the right wavelength. Um, but but um, Müller was, was, was on the path to doing this in the right way. So this was all happening, and there was one more piece of the puzzle, and it's the guy there sitting with the glasses, looking at the two younger gentlemen. His name was Joe Smagorinsky, and he was the first director of the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton, New Jersey. It was, a, it was the follow-on to this effort of von Neumann to calculate the weather. And what Smagorinsky, his stroke of brilliance was one in building a team, but in the other aspect, realizing that these methods people had been developing to calculate how the weather moves were exactly what you needed to calculate H. And he put together a lab and the machines that would allow you to build circulation models of the whole Earth that would allow you to calculate the H term. So that got us through this grand contemplation of the, of the glacier retreating, and it takes us to about 1965. Not much had happened. The glacier had been retreating. Here I stand in 1965, and to give you a sense of time, at, 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 at this point, summer of 1965, that's when I was conceived, 
born in the spring of 1966. The glacier was, was there where you see it, where I'm standing. And now it's, it's come into our sight. You know, we're closer. We're seeing where it is. Um, we're feeling nearer. But it's still a, a long ways away. So we haven't really understood anything. Deep thought hasn't really given a peep as to the answer to the ultimate question. But a lot of stuff has happened in the background, and the glacier, meanwhile, has ponderously retreated up the valley. And then something brilliant happens. Actually, a paper is published in 1967 from this kid, Suki Minabe. I mean, see him there with his, I, I don't know what kind of terminal that is. Maybe some of you have one at home still. But, but he understood. He took, working with actually Fritz Müller, he returned to this Arrhenius question. And he said, well, you know, Arrhenius, Brilliant guy, great question, but he did it wrong. Um, so uh, Manabi showed that to really understand the question, you needed to formulate it differently. You couldn't throw V away. You needed V, this vertical transport of heat. He also realized you couldn't solve for V directly, but he found a clever indirect way of putting V in the equation in a way that was approximately right. He worked with Müller to figure out how to do the R right. And he took advantage of the computing machines that Smagorinsky had sort of surrounded him with to make the first compelling calculation of what the surface temperature would do if you increased C by a factor of two. So it was, it was, it was, it was wonderful because he literally turned Arrhenius' theory on its head. He introduced a model for V and he, he took the latest understanding of R and he brought this equation full force forward and he gave the first sense of an answer. It was, it was as if deep thought kind of burped in the middle of its contemplation at year, say, 50, 50 million. So it was terrific. But if you look at that equation, H is still missing, O is still missing, V is approximate. Do we believe him? As an example, let's just think how he treated R. So if you look at R, you know, this is the radiation, it's the R term, and the radiation, uh, the radiation Arrhenius treated as sort of one stream with the wrong spectroscopy. Manabi said, let's treat it as four streams. So we have sort of um, water vapor and, and CO2 and ozone, and that's a bit illustrated here. It shows the absorption spectrum in the infrared. This is the wavelengths where Earth is trying to radiate its energy to space. And if the atmosphere was transparent, that orange line you see wouldn't be up and down and up and down and up and down. It would follow this wonderful Planck curve, which is illustrated by that little white curve on the bottom right. It wouldn't be that low, but it would follow the envelope of those ups and downs. And every time you see that orange line go down, it means that there's absorption taking place, mostly from water vapor, CO2, ozone, and in the middle, right in the middle, you see this big absorption feature where a bunch of lines go down, and that's the CO2 absorption band that I pointed to before from Müller's work in the 30s. And so if you look at that, you see it's fantastically complicated. And Manabi just kind of represented that sort of as four streams, or three or four streams, depending how you, you count the overlap. And when you unfold that, you see it's fantastic. I mean, it's not like there's four regions, there's just thousands and thousands of absorption features that you have to calculate your way through if you want to do the radiation right. Of course, they didn't even know that at the time. I mean, they knew the absorption features that comes from um, quantum physics, but, but they didn't know where they were. They didn't know their multiplude. They didn't know the strength. And even if they did, there was no way in hell they could compute them. It turns out today we could compute them, and we have. So this graph was made by Lucas Kluft, a, a graduate student working with me. And he repeated Manabi's calculations. The same ones, but he just did R based on all that we know today. He calculated every single line in that thing. And the rest he left the same. You know, that approximation of V, leaving out H, forgetting about O, and so on. And he came up with the same answer. So Manabi was good. I mean, he was really good. He, he got it right in a very simple way. And it really ended the first era of deep thoughts contemplations. So if we go back just to recap, you know, we began at the end of the 19th century, 1896 was Arrhenius' first paper on the topic, where he had the idea, he kind of knew the ingredients, and he puzzled him his way to a, a sensible solution. But, I mean, there was lots of things that weren't really right. And a lot of science happened in between. 
not paying much attention to what he did, but then we saw some machines emerge which allowed this guy, Manabi, to turn Arrhenius' ruminations on their head and show how to solve the problem right and give the very first estimate. It's sort of like, ah, deep thought's done. Not quite. It turns out, like you can imagine, right? This was, this V was approximate, H wasn't there, O wasn't there. So a lot of people say, hey, that's just a pre-answer. I mean, that's not right. You know, why do we believe Manabi? Manabi asked that himself. He said, why would I believe Manabi? Probably he believed himself. But the reason he wouldn't believe himself is he knew the Earth looked something like that. So this is a picture of Earth from space. It's a satellite image. It just shows part of the disk. And what it shows in the very dark colors is um, thermal radiation. That dark means there's lots of it coming, and that's because it's coming from deep in the atmosphere, near the surface where the temperatures are high. Where it's gray, that means there's a lot less radiation because the stuff that's emitting the radiation is much colder. So it's coming from higher in the atmosphere because we know as you move through the troposphere, the temperature decreases. And where it's white, it's, it's, it's radiation that's emitted from the very coldest parts of the troposphere, where temperatures are about uh, 100 degrees Celsius colder um, than, than, than zero, and hardly any radiation is escaping to space. That's where we have clouds, which are, which are essentially emitting radiation at very cold temperatures in the upper troposphere. And what you see in this, in this figure is different patterns. You see swirls towards the poles, which will move generally from west to east. So if we let this move like it does, the satellite's watching in time, you can see how these swirls evolve. And these swirls are a visual manifestation of how the circulation is transporting heat and moisture from the equator, where it gets a lot of energy, to the pole, where it loses its energy. And it shows how this transport happens in different ways. At the, at the high latitudes, you see the swirls. In the middle, near the equator, you see more like this, I don't know, this sort of, you see these pulses. And it, it doesn't have this directionality from, from west to east and south to north, where you see the, 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 the transport going on. So it's a different mechanism of heat transport. And what you see is in the tropics, this heat transport is much more vertical. And that's because the climate system, as this figure shows, is really trying to do two things. It gets a lot of energy from the sun, and most of that goes into the oceans and the tropics. That energy is transported into the atmosphere by deep storms, like you see here now as you look into the atmosphere, deep storms forming over land and over the ocean in the tropics. That's the V. And it's transported to the poles by the H, this horizontal heat transport. So Manabi's calculation had none of that, really. It had a, a crude trick to calculate what the V is doing, and it had none of the H. So there's lots of ways other than R being wrong in which it could be wrong. And he realized that, so he, he said, we need to couple this to the bigger problem, him and his boss, Joe Smagdarinsky. Um, all along, they had the idea, let's put this into a circulation model of the type that was calculating the weather, and that would allow us to evaluate whether H makes a difference. And so they made models that look kind of like this. And here, the color skating is similar. There's some purples there, which is um, rain. But again, the black is where the atmosphere is very dry or um, very transparent, and, and lots of energy is coming out of the system and going to space. And white is areas where the, the part of the atmosphere which is radiating energy is, is very high in the atmosphere and very cold. And you see these systems moving in the extra tropics at the high latitudes, at the latitudes of North America or Europe moving from west to east. And the same thing in the southern hemisphere, you see them moving from west to east. And then they're kind of blinking spastically in the tropics. And that's because the circulation model can do the H okay on these scales, but it really doesn't have a clue about V other than to use that, let's call it the trick or the cleverness of Manabi to, to indirectly represent the V. So when you do this calculation, it, 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 you, you end up more or less getting the same answer as he did with the simpler one, where he neglected H. And so what, what this does is it brings us to um, another milestone around the year 1980, 1979 to be precise. And here I am in 1979 in the, in the life of our glacier. We're kind of narrowing in on it. It's still retreating on us. It left this big stone for us to remind us of the Alte Schwede. Um, but here we are in 1979 getting close to where we want to be, you know, asking the glacier the meaning of the universe or why it's going um, away. 
we're close to where we want to be, and it's, it's, it's a milestone year because we've, we've rediscovered Arrhenius's question, and we've worked out a pretty good semblance of an answer. We've got H, we've got R. Okay, V is a problem, and we don't know so much about O. And this was sort of a capstone of this was this wonderful report called the Charney Report, written in 1979, very short, easy to read, beautiful report, which summarized the knowledge at that time and the observation that CO2 was increasing to make the first sort of formal statement about what deep thought might eventually give us when it was ready to give us the answer. So 1979, great report, most elements of the answer. And at this point, you could say, well, you know, we're, we're mostly done, and there's reasons I'll get to in a few minutes, which would ex lead us to expect that we're not going to get much better than what was written down in this report. But, but one thing did happen. So we're now entering this, I think it was the third phase in that, in that, that chronology I, I, I gave you, this, this period of constructive babble that I referred to. We had tools that allowed us to calculate how the circulation H connected to the radiation. We couldn't really deal with V. We hadn't really thought too much about O. But we had a good sense of the question, and we had a rough idea of the answer. You know, doubling CO2 would lead the Earth to be, according to this report, it would be one and a half to four and a half degrees warmer. So in this period of constructive babble, there was this one genius stroke. Um, as I remember that diagram where I showed the glacier receding year by year, and in this third epoch, not much happened, but there was this one excursion. This guy is kind of like that excursion, this erratic excursion. He's, he's someone um, from Hamburg, actually. He, for a long time, he was the founding director of my institute. Um, he's retired now, goes often for walks, not so far away from the Alte Schwede. But what he did when he was back, um, a younger man, was he realized that it's not enough to know that the Earth should warm when there's CO2. We should be able to detect it. And what he did was he worked out two things. He worked out what's our expectation for how the system would behave if there was no warming? What's the natural variability in the system? And he understood very deeply that, that the Earth system has this, this wonderful way of digesting, let's call it weather noise, the noise of passing weather systems, digesting them by the ocean in a way that translates them into long-term variability, so decadal and multi-decadal and centennial which means that we could observe a warming Earth in a retreat of a glacier for reasons m which might have absolutely nothing to do with increasing greenhouse gases. And he went from that realization to also realizing that if the warming that we're observing is from CO2, it might have a signature that looks different than the signature of natural variability. And he set out with a team to build models that you could put on computers like this one. I think that's the one they used eventually that you could put on computers like this Cray 2S to actually work out how the fingerprint of warming might differ from the signature of natural variability. And ask the question, can we detect the warming from observations? And lo and behold, he could. And so this was the very first detection to say that not only was Manabi particularly clever, but the ideas he developed allowed us to say that the warming we observe isn't natural variability. It's not the effect of the sun. It's from increasing greenhouse gases. So that was a, a masterstroke. But other, otherwise, in this period of, of a constructive, constructive babble, I would say, you know, mostly people just tried to make the models like I showed before, that black and white one, a bit more colorful, with a bit more rev, uh, resolution. And, and that's sort of shown here. This is a, the type of model that leading climate centers around the world use today to make these climate projections. They're not really different from what Manabi was doing in any structurally important way. They've got lots and lots and lots more bells and whistles. So you could think of this positively as that people have been fiddling with this O term. They've been adding, you know, other things into the system to see if it really changes the picture. And what you realize is it doesn't change the picture. The big thing, and Manabi taught us that at the, at the very beginning, you know, when he corrected Arrhenius's calculation, the big thing is getting the V right. And as pretty as people make these sorts of models look, they don't help in the least with V. And now I want to explain to you why V is difficult and why, back when Manabi was doing this, we shouldn't expect to get V right. So this is a Earth at night. And if we let the film roll, what we see is that 
as we rotate, we come into the view of the sun and the sun rises. And what I wanted to illustrate here is how thin the atmosphere is. And this thinness of the atmosphere on one hand is a really wonderful thing because it means that the H term involves a sort of quasi two-dimensional circulation. There's not a lot of vertical going on. Transporting energy from the equator to the pole happens in a thin atmosphere and you don't need to worry so much about the vertical to get it right. And that's what allowed us, they have very large scales, that's what allowed us to make progress. But the thinness becomes a problem when you think about V. So you can attach some numbers to this, and I've done that here. And what you see is we know the Earth's circumference is about 40,000 kilometers. So going from the equator to the pole is, is, is about 10,000 kilometers. The eddies, these swirls that move the energy, are about 1,000 kilometers on characteristic scale. So to represent them in a computer in the way that Manabi and Smagorinsky did, you need to be able to discretize the Earth in, in, in blocks that resolve circulations which are about 1,000 kilometers. They could do that in the, in the 70s. But if you want to get V, you need two orders of magnitude. You don't need 1,000 kilometers, you need 10 kilometers because the atmosphere is so thin. But if you think of that, 10 kilometers, that's a factor of 100 from 1,000. So you need machines which can resolve scales which are a factor of 100 smaller. Doesn't seem like a lot, a factor of 100, but the problem is the atmosphere, the problem has four dimensions. We have to integrate in time. We have the left, right, the back, forth, the up and down. So we've got three spatial dimensions in one time, there's four. So 100 times larger is 2 to the 7, that's 128. But in four dimensions, that becomes 2 to the 28. So it's a massively larger calculation to get V. And in 1979, you had absolutely no right to expect to get it. Because computers were increasing, sure, we had Moore's Law, we had doubling every, 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 every year and a half or so. But really, what kind of technology has exponential growth for what seems like forever? Well, it turns out it's your kind of technology. So if you go back to 1965, when Manabi was doing, doing, doing his calculations, and you look, you know, it's fantastic. We've seen this, this doubling of, of computational capacity going on and on and on and on. Nothing, nothing does this. This shouldn't happen. Think of any other technology that goes, you know, exponential growth is no big deal. That happens all the time for a short period of time. But having exponential growth that goes on forever and ever and ever like this, 50 years, is just crazy. So you could ask yourself, well, in retrospect, we had half a century of doublings. Maybe we should go back and ask ourselves, maybe V isn't so impossible after all. What do we need? Well, we need 28 doublings we just calculated. How long do we have to wait for a doubling? One and a half years. So one and a half times 28 is 28, half 28 is 14, 28 plus 14 is um, 42. So that's the ultimate answer. That's how long we have to wait between getting H and getting V. When do we have H? 1979. So when should we get V? 79, 42, 21. Practically tomorrow. And that's where we're at. We're at the, 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 the edge of the glacier, almost ready for deep thought to spurt out its answer. We just got to get this last little bit. And we have the tools to calculate V, and I'm going to show you the ingredients. We're not there yet. You've got some work to do. But the tools we have, first on a regional scale, this is an example where we use a 150-meter model. And it shows, the, 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 it, it visualizes for you how this vertical transport works in the form of storms, which take moisture and energy from the surface and up deep in the atmosphere where it's colder and it's radiated away. And it shows you how you can also represent the clouds, even these thin layers of clouds, which you see here, which look a bit like that original picture of the Alte Schwede, the stone and the dock and the, and, the, and, the, and the thin clouds that I showed at the beginning. So if we let that run forward in time, what you see is how they, you know, pumps energy through the atmosphere. And we're going to unfold this because the trick is, is to take calculations like this, which were done on the scale of Germany. Here we're looking at them from the, here we're looking at them from the top. We'll look at calculations like this and we'll unfold that and we have to do this globally. So we can't do it now. Here I'm doing it graphically. I'm visualizing for you how we go from 
the scales we want to solve to the global scales. And I'm showing you how close we're getting. So this is where we go to the global scales. Not quite at the fine scale that we want, but not far. And close enough to see what we need to do to get there and that we're going to get there. So these calculations here, now we're, we're running globally on some of the biggest machines we have available in Europe. And it allows us to outline how far we are from that tip of the glacier to get the ultimate answer from the ultimate machine, which you guys are building. So let's see where that takes us. Here we are. We, we can see where the glacier is. We see the last steps we, we have to make. It's a scramble, but we know now we're going to get there. We're going to get to that glacier probably just before it disappears, and we'll be able to give you the answer. I want to show you quick some numbers to convince you of that. So the numbers that I have here are based on the um, Benchmarking on some of the big machines in Europe. We work a lot on Pitstein lately, so this uh, beautiful machine that's ending its lifetime in the Swiss National Computing Center. Mistral, our workhorse here in Hamburg at the German Climate Computing Center. And recently at Jules Booster at the Uli Computing um, Center has allowed us to do some of the benchmarks. And what we try to calculate is throughput. You know, to do the calculation, what we need is to be able to simulate a certain number of days per day to be useful. So if we can't simulate tomorrow before it arrives, then why bother? Kind of the 75 million years. So to be useful, we want to be able to simulate roughly 100 days per day. And we want to do it at a scale where the, the global grid is about 1.5 kilometers. So with these simulations, we can show at 5 kilometers, we get 50 simulated days per day, S, um, per petaflop. And on some more complicated architectures, it's about 25. So we can use this, this sort of um, flop scaling. I know it's not perfect. I know all the problems, but it works for this um, to kind of extrapolate forward. And we say, well, how much more intensive is the computation if we go to the scale we want, 1.25 you know, kilometers, a factor of four? So if you do the math of going from the five kilometer model at this 50s per petaflop, what we need is two to the seven, so 128. And we need two to three of that. The time part has to be strong scaling. But we can do that. So we need another 100 a factor of 100 from these sort of workhorse machines we're using now, and that's already there, that's in place. I mean, if you look at um, the Joules booster, we could do this calculation that we want, we could get the throughput that we want, but maybe we could only do it once. Machines like Fugaku and the emergence of, uh, of Exascale is showing that not only are these calculations feasible, but they're gonna be practical. So you'd say, ah, we don't have to wait too long, you guys don't have to do too much work, we're almost there. But there's a, a bit more to the story. And if you remember those clouds I showed you in that picture with the stone, it turns out that they're a joker. And Manabi actually knew that they're a joker. The problem is maybe the clouds don't stay constant. They might increase or decrease as the planet warms. So it's not just a question of working out V. You got to work out what happens to these thin little clouds. And with a one and a half kilometer model, that might not get you there. But here, even here, we're so close to the glacier, and that's why it's a scramble. I think we can get there. We can get there, we need another factor of 10 in space. But by being clever, we don't need the throughput of S of 100. We can do short simulations that are time sliced from these coarser simulations. And we can work out if the clouds really are a joker. And that's what's outlined in the, in the rest of the numbers there. And it tells you how far away. But if we get an exaflop machine with the sort of performance characteristics of the machines we have now, or a multi exaflop machine, we'll be even able to work out the joker, the clouds. So there's a real chance that we can, we, 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 we can solve this problem. And that brings us to the end of deep thought. So deep thought gets us to the point where we can compute, 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 and we're almost there. Exascale will get us there to get the, the, the final answer. The problem is, it gets us to the glacier. And what's it tell us? We've gone all the way up the valley. We get to the glacier to tell you, according to my calculations, the glacier should be gone. And the glacier's gone. It's a bit like forgetting 
what the question was that we we're asking in the beginning. But here's where Earth comes in. In building this machine to provide the ultimate answer to the ultimate question, we're going to be able to do so much more. And here I want to illustrate that because maybe it's not so relevant to tell you that the glacier is gone when it's gone. But did it go because of CO2 in the atmosphere or was that part of natural variability? Or here, if we look at this picture, this is September 10th of this year and California is burning. You can see the smoke. I mean, many of you know this better than I do. Was that climate change? Or was it just bad luck? Four days later, the Atlantic, it looks like the Van Gogh, the, 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 the starry night picture, because you see swirl after swirl after swirl. These are hurricanes, tropical storms, and pre-tropical storms, and tropical depressions. There's eight of them. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of these storms. I, I follow this stuff because I'm a bit of a geek in that way. And then you, 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 you might see one storm, kind of cool. You look at its eye. You might see two if you're really lucky. Once in a great while, you see three. And here we had eight. Climate change? Who knows? Wouldn't you like to know? Wouldn't we want to know what we're doing to our Earth if it's causing things like this to happen? This is what we need Earth for. Earth in the sense of Douglas Adams. We need a new type of computing capability, not one that's going to give us an answer to tell us that the glacier is gone when the glacier is gone, but one in which we can interact with the system to learn wholly new things. And for that, we have to change something pretty profound. We have to change the way we work with machines, and that hasn't really changed at all through the progression of Moore's Law. And here you can see that a little bit illustrated with this video where you see, you know, in the early days of machines, we were putting tapes on the machine, we were typing in punch cards to, to, to you know, enter our programs into the machine. We'd wait for the machine to calculate, and then the output would come, like, um, you know, big printed output, and we'd kind of look through, you know, uh, 42. There it comes, I, I think you can see it there, maybe. It's not much different today, if you think about it. Okay, we get to work in cafes, so we connect with Wi-Fi, but we're still there, that's the punch card. We're still moving tapes around. It's not, it's not some guy in a suit, it's a robot. Um, and okay, we don't have printouts looking for the number 42, but we can, you know, have guys in virtual environments putting pictures on screens, which visually show you 42, but it's the same serial workflow. But we can do it differently, and you see it here. You know, this is, the, the, the cool thing about this is the, the old way of interacting machines involves experts and layers and layers of expertise, serialness, you know, beginning, middle, end. Here we see the future. And it's not just because they're kids. These are the grandkids of a good colleague of mine. And they're interacting with a machine. And as brilliant as this colleague is, and as brilliant as these kids probably are, they don't know CUDA. They don't even know Python. They probably don't even know English. They couldn't write a sentence. But they're interacting with a machine. So we're creating, we see it happening. We're creating ways to interact with machines like we need to interact with machines to solve these big problems. And so some of us are visualizing th these Earth information systems where we take machines like Deep Thought and expose their information content to users who can, who can work through the consequences of their actions, of their policies, of their imaginations, of their hypotheses, to try to understand how changes in ag agriculture will affect food security in Africa, or how changes with warming will affect um, flooding in Northern Europe. This is what we need to do. And we meaning you guys who are going to build the machines and us guys who are going to be developing the models that you can put on those machines. And it turns out some people actually get this. And there's a big effort behind it. Here's the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Let's listen. And with the European Green Deal, we are aiming high. Europeans are calling on us to drive the change. Now it's up to us to answer their call. Thank you so much. It turns out that there's real money behind this Green Deal and a brilliant vision. And the brilliant vision is building planetary information systems that allow us to work through the consequences of our actions, of our policies, to see how they affect our world so that we can build a more sustainable future. And it involves a partnership between people like you and people like me, and it provides funding 
and it envisions a, 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 a grand new attempt to understand how our world works and how we're influencing it. It's coupled, if it's done right, with a wonderful data assimilation system. That's this circle that goes around it there, which allows you to don't panic. It's not one shot. We're building systems which can learn from data, which can, be, which can learn from their use to make ever more adaptive and, and, and clever systems for representing how the world works and the consequences of people's interactions with it. So this is the future. This is, this is Earth. This is building interactive systems. And that's our next job. So we have to get over that, 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 that rock cliff to the edge of the glacier just to tell people it's gone. But in getting over that last hurdle, we'll build the machines that we then need to turn inside out in the second phase to make Earth. So I'm going to leave you with that thought here, is that like Douglas Adams' book, we're going to all this trouble to make a big machine to make an ultimate answer to an ultimate question that doesn't matter anymore. But the beauty is, in doing that, we've created an information system that allows us to do what we need to do next, which is to create information systems that we can go into and we can literally grab the Earth, anyone, and see what the consequences of their actions mean for how things will evolve. What if we change agricultural policies in, 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 in Africa? How does that affect food security? What if the ice caps melt? How does that affect um, rising sea levels? What if we invest in a distributed way? How vulnerable are we to storms? Um, these are sorts of questions that people can ponder if we give them the right tools. And that's our job now, is to give them these tools. So that's the next great adventure after we get up to the ice, um, is to create new types of information systems where people can expose the full information content to users that can, can use that in a tangible way. And so with that thought, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and wish you a um, wonderful day. I'm here for questions for the next hour or so, um, and it's been a real pleasure. Thanks also to everyone who made this possible.